It is a joy to give glory and honor the only true God, the Father, who gave his only begotten Son. Hello, and I would like to thank you and uh, praise God the Father for this privilege to share another historical reading of the Seventh Day Adventist Church. Today's subject matter is entitled, Who is the Seventh Day Adventist Offshoot? The non Trinitarian or Trinitarian? Think. Before I share with you the definition of offshoot and the historical timeline of the Seventh day Adventist Church, I would like to invite you for a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, indeed, it is a joy to call you our Father who gave your divine Son to be our substitute to be the perfect sacrifice to redeem us from our violation of the law. Father, may this study be productive and beneficial to those who are genuinely searching and would like to know more about the true history of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I ask this in the loving name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Foremost, I would like to define to you the word offshoot. So if you search the meaning of offshoot, it is a noun. And the general diction dictionary would say, a side shoot or branch of a plant. What else is the uh, dictionary telling us about this offshoot that we are trying to understand? It is a thing that originated or developed from something else, similar to subsidiary, branch, derivative, adjunct, appendage, outcome. So people also ask, what is the full meaning of offshoot? Something that has developed from something larger that already existed. Meaning to say that something has been there before the offshoot. Meaning the foundation was different or the foundation was there. The offshoot just branched out or came along. I will not dwell or read more of the definition. I believe you already understood what I'm trying to say or understand what I'm trying to say. So now let us return to the Adventist timeline of change from as it reads dot com. This is an exciting um, reading because this will blow by blow give us the uh, reason and the history behind the church uh, of the seventh day then and now. So remember, the offshoot is not the original, meaning the offshoot just came out from the existing foundation, the original foundation. So the question in the question that should matter now is who is the original, non-Trinitarian or Trinitarian? And why did they change? Okay, so let us read. Adventist timeline of change. As you can see the picture, this is a factual uh, picture. It's not edited. It says there on the corner of the church, Seventh Day Adventist. So this is how they look like before. And um, let us now read. This is a step-by-step -step illustration of our early church pioneers or old timers dying off in the effects of educated scholar scholars inserting their academic influence in changing the direction of our church to what has become now from non-Trinitarian to a decisively a Trinitarian denomination. Well, there are quite a few more events that have taken place to keep the focus on the subject of change. We have elected to stay with the key events. All right, 1860. The remnant Sabbath-keeping Advent believers is given the name Seventh-day Adventist, which carried heaven's approval. 1863, 
organization of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, May 20, 1863. Source, transcript of minutes of GC sessions from 1863 through 1888. If you go to their website, you can click the PDF and you can examine these documents more clearly. So now we will go to the formulation of the original foundation so that at this moment, at this juncture, we will now know the foundation of the church. So this is the foundation of the church as declared. 1872, the Declaration of Fundamental Principles taught and practiced by Seventh-day Adventists consisting of 25 propositions largely written by James White is published as a pamphlet at Battle Creek, Michigan. You can view the download of the original pamphlet. You can click here if you go to their website. This lays down a clear non-Trinitarian foundation and is not replaced or changed in any way until 1931. These propositions are based on 1 Corinthians 8 verse 6 and contain neither the term Godhead nor Trinity. First year that the fundamental principles were actually published in the yearbook was 1889. Prior to 1981, the years of published are 1905, 1909, 1913, 1914. Then it goes dark, but published again until it changes in 1931. Then 1942, 1955, 1965, 66, 1973, and 74, 1975, 1980, and 1981. So this is the uh, fundamental principles of the Seventh-day Adventist. Let me read their principles. In the unconscious state of the dead and the final destruction of the unrepentant wicked from another, let me... Uh, let me read here, backtrack for a moment. I'm sorry to, for that. As compared with the others, Adventists, Seventh-day Adventists differ from one class in believing in the unconscious state of the dead and the final destruction of the unrepentant wicked from another in believing in the perpetuity of the law of God as summarily contained in the Ten Commandments, in the operation of the Holy Spirit in the church and in setting no times for the advent to occur from all in the observation of the seventh day of the week as the Sabbath of the Lord, and in many applications, the prophetic scriptures. While these remarks, we ask the attention of the reader to the following propositions, which aim to be a concise statement of the more prominent features of our faith. Number one and number two, please read for your own um, diligence, due diligence to um see if, and examine for yourselves whether these things are true or not so this is the original fundamental principle that there is one god a personal spiritual being the creator of all things omni omnipotent omniscient and eternal infinite in wisdom holiness justice goodness truth and mercy unchangeable and everywhere present by his representative the holy spirit psalm 139 verse 7. Number two, belief that there is one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Eternal Father, the one by whom God created all things and by whom they, they do consist. And it took on him the nature of the seed of Abraham for the redemption of our fallen race, that he dwelt among men full of grace and truth, lived our example, died our sacrifice, was raised for our justification ascended on high to be our only mediator in the he in the sanctuary in heaven, where with his own blood he makes atonement for our sins, which atonement so far from being made on the cross, which was but the offering of the sacrifice, is the very last portion of his work as priest, according to the example of the Levitical priesthood, which foreshadowed and prefigured the ministry of our Lord in heaven. See Leviticus 16. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 4, 5, and chapter 9, verse 6, 7, etc. So you can read the next um, 23 fundamental beliefs. 1872, death of Elder Joseph Bates. Eight, 1874, the fundamental principles of 1872 are published again by James White 
in the first issue of the Science of the Times, June 4, 1874. So clearly at this juncture, dearly beloved, we have an answer. The church began with unanimity of decision or consent. The church began as non-Trinitarian, as published and documented. The first issue, The Science of the Times, June 4, 1874, Volume 1, Number 1, Page 3, and Uriah Smith in the Advent Review Herald and Herald in the Sabbath of the Sabbath, November 24, 1874, Volume 44, Number 22, Page 171. In his introductory remarks to the fundamental principles in the science, James White states, and presenting to the public this synopsis of our faith, we wish to have it distinctly understood that we have no articles of faith creed or discipline aside from the Bible. We do not put forth this as having authority with our people, nor is designed to secure uniformity among them as a system of faith, but it's a brief statement of what is and has been and with great unanimity held by them. This are the declaration of James White, the husband of Alan G. White. This is the proof or the document that our fundamental principles are the first, the original, the uh, root, as published in 1874, Signs of the Times, 1874. You can see here prominently the fundamental principles that we are talking about. So clearly, at this juncture, the Seventh-day Adventist Church was a non-Trinitarian movement. They don't have beliefs. They don't have creeds. They do not uh, subscribe to to um, system uh, as a system of faith like other Sunday keeping churches who are Trinitarian and they have their own creeds. They were saying that they have this unanimity and understanding of the fundamental principles. The first principle, there is one true God who gave his only begotten. The second is one Lord Jesus, as you can see published here. And here it is in the publication of Signs of the Times. So you might be asking at this juncture, what happened? So what, what became of the Seventh-day Adventists now? Now that is where the offshoot story begins. So now we have answered at this early juncture based on the proof that was read to us today and the documents, the Seventh-day Adventist was a non-Trinitarian movement. But what happened? What happened to the church? Why it is now a Trinitarian so th this is the um, analysis of the historical and theological um, significance of the church. So bear with me. Now we, will, now we will answer the question, why did the Seventh-day Adventist change? Who did change? What are the reasons? <clears throat> In 1877, the biblical... Institute where Uriah Smith and James White outlined the princ principal doctrines of Seventh day Adventist is held in Oakland, California, covering everything from the sanctuary to the prophecy, the nature of sin to the nature of Christ. This institute confirms and strengthens the teachings of Adventism as outlined in the Fundamentals of 1872. So that is a very clear statement there. All right, so let us continue our reading. But in 1881, unfortunately, Elder James White died. 1883, Elder death of Elder J.B. Prisby and Elder John Nevins Andrews. So that stalwarts, non-Trinitarian stalwarts, unfortunately died. So that's um, a considered, a considered um, Part of the, um, perhaps part of the uh, circumstances that led to the change because these two men were stalwarts, were intellectual, uh, in intellectually educated and well-equipped, especially with, with the Bible. John Nevins Andrews, who bears the name Andrews University, who now bears the names Andrews University is ironic because Andrews University School of Theology teaches Trinity, while John Nevin, Nevins Andrews was a non-Trinitarian. Do you see now the anomaly 
why it was non-Trinitarian, but then they would use John Nevins Andrews to teach Trinitarian. What an irony in the memory of a non-Trinitarian uh, intellectual giant in the Seventh-day Adventist faith. Let us read further. 1883, at the general conference session, it is decided against publishing a church manual as it is deemed undesirable to take any steps toward a, dis a, dis a discipline, creed, or form of formalism. Review and Herald, November 27. 1888, the 27th General Conference Session is held at Minneapolis, Minnesota, with 91 delegates and approx approximately 475 attendees. God brings the truth of justification by faith to his people through elders Wagoner and Jones. Built on a powerful biblical foundation, this message of the love of God marks the beginning of the loud cry. But sadly, the, the message is resisted, resisted by a large majority of the church leadership. Elder White, uh, Ellen White writes, the prejudices and opinions that prevail at Minneapolis are not dead by any means. The seeds there sown are ready to spring into life and bear a like harvest. Because the roots are still left and will bear their unholy fruit to poison the perception and blind the understanding of those you connect with in regard to the messengers and messages that God sends. Manuscript 40, 1890, 1888 materials, chapter 115. Now let us go to 1889. What happened there? The fundamental principles are expanded to 28 sections and published in the 1889 yearbook, leaving the first two on the doctrine of God and change. So even in 1889, we can see here from this uh, timeline that the one true God and his son were not changed, 1889. It remains unchanged during its reprinting from 1905 to 1914. 14 in the seventh day of this yearbook. You can click here to view the download of the original 1889 SDA yearbook. Fundamental principles are found on pages 147 to 151. 1889, death of Elder Joseph Harvey Wagoner, Alec Joseph Wagoner's father. 1889, Dudley M. Conright, a prominent leader in Adventism who left the church in 1887. Publishes, publishes a book, Seventh-day Adventism, renounced. In the book, on page 25, he levels against his former brethren, stating they reject the doctrine of the Trinity. This proves, in 1889, that they were solid, non-Trinitarian. And there were prominent people who begin to attack the church, like D.M. Canwright. 1890. Leadership attempts to remove the name Seventh-day Adventist from the American Sentinel, Religious Liberty Journal of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, to make the magazine popular with other denominations. But this step is averted because a living prophet is present. Ellen White states, this policy is the first step in a succession of wrong steps. Counsels to Writer and Editors, page 96. The leading brethren are taking down the road to ecumenical concessions. 1891, the General Conference sends Ellen White far away to Australia, contrary to the light given her, This Day with God, page 61. E.G. Wagoner is sent to England as editor of The Present Truth for 10 years to separate him from A.T. Jones and Ellen G. White. Letter from Willie C. White to... A.G. Daniels, May 30, 1902. 1892, death of Elder Roswell F. Cottrell. 1892, Bible Students, Library Series Lessons to, for the Public, number 90. The Bible Doctrine of the Trinity, reprint of article in New York, independent, independent on November 14, 1899. Author Samuel Spear from Samuel, Samuel Spear, non SDA. Promotes one God subsisting and acting in three hypostasis persons, but also in eternal divine subordination of the Son to the Father. The track used terms not generally used by Adventists, but it is generally non-Trinitarian in content. 
1894. Ellen White warns it is a great mistake on the part of those who are children of God to speak the bridge, to seek the bri to bridge the gulf that separate them from the children of darkness by yielding principle, by compromising the truth. Bible Echo, April 9, 1894, paragraph 6. It is backsliding, it is a backsliding church that lessens the dis distance between itself and the papacy. S.T. Fever 19, 1894. These councils would later be disregarded by the leadership, as we, sh as we shall see. 1894, Herbert Camden Lassie attends Sunday Keeping Trinitarian Meeting as a Battle Creek College delegate to Student Volunteer Movement for Foreign Missions in Michigan. Lassie reaccepts the Trinity Doctrine. 1895, Ellen White warns the leadership in Battle Creek. The Lord has not placed any one of his human agencies under the dictation and control of those who are themselves but erring mortals. But there is a power exercised in Battle Creek that God has not given, and he will judge those who assume his authority. Brethren, leave God to rule. TM 347, paragraph 3. 1896, H. Camden Lassie, H. Camden Lassie lectures on Trinity in Kurambong, Australia. Sister Marion Davis, literary assistant to Ellen White, takes copious notes. Arthur G. Daniels does not oppose the lectures. 1896, recommendations for essential change at general conference session. To choose one man as president, but the brethren are advised that it is not wise to do so. Ellen White warns, to place man where God should be placed does not honor or glorify God. Is the president of general conference to be this, the God of the people? Are the men at Battle Creek to be regarded as infinite in wisdom? Cease ye from men. TM 375, paragraph 2. 1897, what happened here? John Harvey Kellogg presents his first concepts leading to pantheism at a series of studies he gives at the general conference session. 1898, the Review and Herald prints an article from the King's Messenger, which is Trinitarian in teaching, the God-Man, 1898. 1898, R.A. Underwood's view of the Holy Spirit changes from an influence to a person, thus becoming a Trinitarian. 18, 19, 1898, Ellen White states, The church is in the Laodicean state. The presence of God is not in her midst. Manuscript 156, 1898. Notebook, Leaflets from Elms Haven Library, Volume 1. Need of Self-Sacrificing Effort. Page 99. So now let us go to the turn of the century, 1900s. This is significant as we move, move forward to identify and to understand what exactly happened with the offshoot that is beginning to grow in the leadership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So at this point, 1900s, we know that the foundation was non-Trinitarian. That is clear. That is Truth. Now let us go to the offshoot. This is now the time wherein we will see the outgrowth of Trinitarian teachings. 1900. The Review and Herald again prints two more articles from the King's Messenger, both of which are Trinitarian in teaching. The Third Person, January 1900, and Blended Personalities, April 1900. 1901. The American Standard Version of the Bible is first published as per headed by Wiscott and Hort in England, and so the other counter, counterparts of those committee to revise the, the, the King James Version Bible is underway as well in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The American Standard Version of the Bible is first published. The move towards a common Bible between Catholics and Protestants will influence Adventism in small steps away from truth. So, Westcott and Hort were busy in the Europe, and their counterpart uh, here in America were also busy revising the American Bible. They call it the American Standard Version, which 
is a bridge between Catholics and Protestants. 1901, recommendations for change are repeated and voted. One chairman is to heed, head the general conference for only one year. Arthur Daniels is elected, but two years later, he is still president. General Conference Executive Committee increases its number from 13 to 25, GCB page 151. I'm thinking of Saul when uh, I'm reading this. Ellen White warns that the church is working upon wrong principles, manuscript 37, page 98, 1901. The people had lost confidence in those who have the management of the work. Yet we hear that the voice of the conference is the voice of God. Every time I heard this, I had thought it was almost blasphemy. Manuscript 37, 1901, page 8, 1902. John Harvey Kellogg prepares to publish his work, The Living Temple. He is told not to include his new theories, but ignores the council. He tries to gain approval at the Autumn Council for his book to be published, but a letter from Ellen White to Daniels counsels him to have nothing to do with the book. Kellogg takes his manuscript to the Review and Herald Publishing House as outside work, and they agreed, and they agreed to print it. As their result, the Battle Creek Sanitarium, February 18, is headed by, headed by Kellogg and the Review and Herald Printing Office, December 30, burned to the ground. And with the galley proofs of Kellogg's book, Living Temple. But he takes the manuscript to a non-Adventist printer. 23 fires would happen between 1901 and 1923. Judgment has ruled from the heavens above. 1902. Ellen White feels perplexed and frustrated with the general conference and decides to withdraw herself from all their meetings. She writes to her sons Edson and Willie, I have but little confidence that the Lord is giving this man in positions of responsibility, spiritual eyesight, and heavenly discernment. I am thrown into perplexity over their course, and I desire now to attend to my special work, to have no part in any of their councils and to attend no camp meetings, nigh or afar off. My mind shall not be dragged into confusion by the tendency they manifest to work directly contrary to the light that God has given me. I am done. I will preserve my God-given intelligence. My voice has been heard in the different conferences and at camp meetings. I must now make a change. I shall therefore leave, leave them to receive word from the Bible. This is the light given me, and I shall not depart from it. Letter W-186 to De December 2, 1902 to Edison and Willie White, page 4 and 5. 1903. Crisis begin with Living Temple in the Alpha Heresy. Kellogg prints the book in which he has placed his theories. Ellen White says they are spiritualistic and akin to pantheism. Special Testimonies B, number 6, page 41. She says these teachings are the alpha of deadly heresies. First, selected messages 200. And that the Omega would follow in a little while. I tremble for our people. In living temple, the assertion is made that God is in the flower, in the leaf, in the sinner. But God does not live in the sinner. The word declares that he abides only in the hearts of those who love him and do righteousness. God does not abide in the heart of the sinner. It is the enemy who abides there. Sermons and Talks, Volume 1, page 341, 343. But Kellogg claims that his book is in harmony with Ellen White's writings and can be sustained by statements from the testimonies. Ellen White tells him he has taken her statements away from their connection and interpreted them according to his own mind. I saw what was coming in, and I saw that our brethren were blind. They did not realize the danger. Sermons and Talks, Volume 1, page 344. In a vision, Ellen White sees a platform braced by solid timbers, the truths of the Word of God. Someone high in responsibility in the medical work was directing this man and that man to loosen the timbers supporting this platform. First, selected messages, 204. 
Now let us examine what happened in 1903. 1903, Autumn Council, the understanding of the character and personality of God comes under threat. A.G. Daniels is concerned that the supporters of the living temple would cause a confrontation and, there, and there's not call for a vote. Ellen White writes to him, be careful how you sustain the sentiments of this book regarding the personality of God. It has been represent, represented to me that the writer of this book is on a false track. Keepers of the Flame, number six, Dr. Alan Lindsay. After the council, Daniels writes to W.C. White regarding the proposed changes Kellogg has planned for the book. Regarding Dr. Kellogg's plan for, plans for revising and republishing Living Temple, within a short time, he had come to believe in the Trinity and could now see pretty clearly where all the difficulty was. He now believed in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And his view was that it was God the Holy Ghost and not God the Father that filled all space and every living thing. October 29, 1903, pages 1 and 2. Ellen White writes to Kellogg, You are not definitely clear on the personality of God, which is everything to us as a people. You have virtually destroyed the Lord God himself. Letter 300, The Elms Haven Years, Volume 5, 1900-1905, Arthur L. White, 1941. She further predicts what will happen in the future. The enemy of souls has sought to bring in the supposition that the Great Reformation was to take place among Seventh-day Adventists. And that this reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith and engaging in a process of reorganization. Were these reformation to take place, what would result? The principles of truth that God in his wisdom has given to the remnant church would be discarded. Our religion would be changed. The fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the past, for the last 50 years, would be accounted as error. A new organization would be established. Books of a new order would be written. A system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced. First, Selected Messages 204. 1903. New constitution is proposed to provide for the election of a GC president who will be given a mandate from the church. This will give the president and leading officers authority to enact what they think the people need. Daniels is made president for the next 20 years. New constitution provides for the executive committee of 25 members to have full administrative, administrative power between sessions for any five members as a quorum to take steps that will involve the whole committee. Ellen White writes, these principles are so foreign to God's principles that God cannot bless those who vote upon them. GCB, 1903, page 152. E.G. Wagner also objects, it is fundamentally and diametrically opposed to the principles of organization as set forth in the Bible. General Conference Bulletin Board, General Conference Bulletin, 1903, Percy Megan says, there are the same principles and, and, and introduced in precisely the same way as they were hundreds of years ago when the papacy was made. John Conference Bulletin, Day 3, Number 10, page 150. A.T. Jones states, This proposed constitution is subversive of the principles of organization given to us at the General Conference of 1897 and that of 1981. GCB 1903, page 152-153. This general conference session has rejected the 1897 and 1901 recommendations. What happened in 1903? Uriah Smith dies. You can click here for the details of his death and for here for the funeral. 1903, Dr. John Harvey Kellogg promotes Trinitarian doctrines in Battle Creek after converting from pantheism. Kellogg asked Jones to teach at Battle Creek College, Wagoner moves to Battle Creek, placing him in great peril. Ellen White writes to him, Satan is working stealthily, untiringly to affect your downfall through his specious temptations. He hopes to lead you into the mazes of spiritualism. Letter 231, 1903. 
1904, Ellen White has a vision in which the angel says to Jones and Wagner, the sentiments that you have received in harmony with the special theories presented in the book, Living Temple, are not pure truth. There is commingling of truth and error, separate entirely from the bewitching, misleading sentiments that run through Living Temple. Letter 279-1904. For more on Kellogg and the early Adventism, check out this article by Terry Hill, The Early 1900s Crisis, Kellogg and the Holy Spirit. 1904, Ellen White has another vision of Kellogg. The subject upon which he was speaking was life and the relation of God to all living things. In his presentations, he cloaked the matter somewhat, but in reality, he was presenting as of the highest value scientific theories which are akin to pantheism. I was astonished to see with what enthusiasm the sophistries and deceptive theories were received. The influence of this talk gave the speaker encouragement to call for a council of our brethren at Battle Creek for a further examination of these seducing sentiments. Special Testimony, Series B, number 6, page 210. Rebellion and apostasy are in the very air we breathe. Second Selected Messages, 58. The apostasy will develop into darkness, deep as midnight, impenetrable as sackcloth of hair and will increase in strength until the coming of Jesus. Manuscript releases, volume 7, page 105, 185, paragraph 1. In 1904, Ellen White writes, For the past 50 years, every phase of heresy has been brought to bear upon us. Messages of every order and kind had been urged upon Seventh-day Adventists to take the place of the truth, which point by point has been taught, has been sought out by prayer, study, and testified to by the miracle work working power of the Lord. Special Testimony, Series B, number 2, page 59. Notice that in 1904, the foundation of faith has been firmly established. Many of our people do not realize how firmly the foundation of our faith has been laid. My husband, Elder Joseph Bates, Father Pierce, Elder Hiram Idson, and others who were kin, noble, and true were among those who, after the passing of time in 1844, searched for the truth as for hidden treasure. When they came to the point in their study where they said, we can do nothing more, the Spirit of the Lord would come upon me. I would be taken off in vision, and a clear explanation of the passages we have been studying would be given to me with instruction as to how we were to labor and teach effectively. The slide was given that helped us to understand the scriptures in regard to Christ, his mission, and his priesthood, a line of truth extending from that time to the time when we shall enter the city of God, was made plain to me, and I gave to others the instruction that the Lord had given me. Number one, selected messages, 206, paragraph four. Let's go now to 1905. The 19, 1905, the 28 Fundamental Principles of 1888-1889 Synopsis of Our Faith is inserted again in the Church Yearbook and continues until 1914. Ellen White confirms these principles. Every pillar that he has established is to be strengthened. We cannot now step off the foundation that God has established. We cannot now enter into a new organization, for this would mean apostasy from the truth, manuscript. 129-1905, the past 50 years had not deemed one jot or principle of our faith as we received the great and wonderful evidences that were made certain as to us in 1844 after the passing of the time. Not a word is changed or denied. Letter 326, December 4, 1905, the upward look, 352, paragraph 4. In 1905, Daniel Verdot died. 1905, Ellen White says, the writings of the pioneers should be reproduced. God has given me light regarding our periodicals. What is it? He has said that the dead are to speak, how their works shall follow them. We are to repeat the, word, the words of the pioneers in our work, who knew what it cost to search for the truth as for hidden treasure, and who labored to lay the foundation of our work. They moved forward step by step under the influence of the Spirit of God. One by one, these pioneers are passing away. The word given me is, let that which this man had written in the past be reproduced. 
Review and Herald, May 25, 1905. 1907, apostasy is here. With the apostasy of J.H. Kellogg, Ellen White writes, the time of this apostasy is here. Every conceivable effort will be made to throw doubt upon the positions we have occupied for over a half a century. Letter 410, 1907, page 2, to J.E. White, August 26, 1907. Seven manu manuscript releases, 195. Now let us go to 1910. In 1910, the Bible Training School booklet, December issue, was published five years before the death of Ellen White, using the term Trinity on page 13, under question, question box, the Holy Spirit, is described as one of the Trinity and fully, and fully represents God and Christ and the Trinity. See pictures below, and you can click and enlarge. So this is where in 1910, um, they this, uh, published this uh, pamphlet or booklet, Bible Training School. In 1912, the Review and Herald reprints the original principles with the first two, unchanged, one God and one Lord, August 22, 1912, page 4. 1913, F.M. Wilcox published a supposed Trinitarian tract and a quote from Ellen White taken from Desire of Ages, next to it from 18... 98 to paint a false picture of belief in the Re Review and Herald, Volume 6, October 9, 1913, page 21. Wilcox rolls out the divine trinity, which includes the Holy Spirit as the third person of the Godhead. This sets the stage for making the Godhead used exclusively by Ellen G. White, Ellen White equivalent with Wilcox divine trinity. This is apparently a response to counter the claim published by James Gray, of the Moody Bible Institute that Adventism denied the Trinity. James Gray Bible Problems Explained, 1913. So you can read here the article. There is the highlight yellow, the article, uh, the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald. 1915, Ellen White warns of great changes to take place after her death. I am charged to tell our people that do not realize that the devil has device after device and he carries them out in ways that they do not expect. Satan's agencies will invent ways to make sinners out of saints. I tell you now that when I am laid to rest, great changes will take place. I do not know when I shall be taken, and I desire to warn all against the devices of the devil. I want the people to know that I, I have, I that I warned them fully before my death. Manuscript, one February 24, 1915. So in 1915, Ellen G. White dies. When Ellen G. White died in July 1915, three funerals in a graveside service memorialize her life of ministry. An estimated 5,400 people attended these services. The first funeral was held July 18 on the lawn of her home, at her home in California known as Elms Haven. A second was held the next day in Oakland, California. The third and largest service was held on Sabbath, July 24 in Battle Creek, Michigan, where Ellen White had lived for many years and where she was to be buried beside her husband, James. 1915. The synopsis of our faith, which is the fundamental principles, mostly written by James White in 1872 and inserted in 1889 yearbook and again in 1905-1914 yearbooks, are now removed from the 1915 SDA yearbook by a mere general conference statistician, Edson Rogers. He obviously did it as soon as the living prophet has died. Thus, the fundamental principles held in great unanimity by the pioneers are put out of the way. 1916. Elder E.J. Wagoner and Dr. David Polson died. Die. 1918. Death of Elder George L. Butler, Elder James H. Morrison, and Elder W. H. Little John. 1919. Bible and Teachers Conference takes place in secrecy with the discussion. Becoming heated at times as some in leadership position test the waters to see if the doctrine of the Trinity can be brought in. 
there is enough resistance to table the conversation for another time. The recorded minutes for this five-week-long event, July 1 to August 1, disappears for 55 years until 1974. You can click here for the full original report of the 1919 Bible Conferences. Bible Conference 7, um, 7 1 to August 1, 1919. You can click here for the notes of the Bible Conferences provided by Gary Hulaquist. 1922. Hudson Washburn writes an open letter to Daniel saying the 1919 Bible conference was the most terrible thing that has ever happened in the history of this denomination. J.S. Washburn, an open letter to Elder A.G. Daniels in an appeal to the General Conference 1922, page 28-29. Another letter written by Washburn to Claude Holmes is published as a 36-page tract called The Startling Omega and its True Genealogy. It is distributed at the General Conference of 1922. In this tract, he men mentions that the college in Washington has become a nest of higher criticism, and he blames Daniels and Prescott for all the theological problems. Omega Tract, Washburn, page 1 and 6. 1922, Elder Stephen N. Haskell, author of many best-selling books and Adventist pioneer, dies. 1923, Elder Alonzo Trevor Jones and Elder O.A. Johnson die. 1924, John Norton Lafvoro, the last of the first generation core of pioneers, dies. 1926, Leroy Fromm, who is the first associate secretary and then made secretary of the General, Confer General Conference Ministerial Association until 1950, is asked to present studies on the Holy Spirit at the Milwaukee General Conference session. In preparation for his studies, Fromm went to books written by authors outside of our faith. He went to Babylon for his material. To reference their writings as he could not find in our own denomination writings that would line up with his agenda. Gradually, the meaning of the word divine changed until it meant not fully divine. We do not know how it changed, but Trinitarians were using the term deity instead of divine. Once divine and deity meant the same. When Fromm uses the words all the fullness of the Godhead, he is making two statements. An Aryan or semi-Aryan belief is not true Christianity, and the Trinity has a savior with full deity. 1926. General Conference Working Policy, Sir 75, is adopted. Seventh-day Adventist Church becomes part, a part of the evangelical churches. The policy states, we recognize every agency that lifts up Christ before man as part of the divine plan for the evangelization of the world. And we would hold in high esteem the Christian man and woman in other communions who are engaged in winning souls to Christ. Relationship to other societies, General Conference, Exco, 1926. This would include the Jesuit order. Ellen White has warned, shall this power whose record for a thousand years is written in the blood of the saints be now acknowledged as, part, as a part of the Church of Christ? Great Controversy, 1888, page 571.1. This is the first wrong step toward ecumenical concessions taken by the General Conference. 1928, death of Elder James Edson White, the son of James and Ellen White. 1928, Leroy Fromm is invited to present a series of studies on the Holy Spirit at the North American Union Ministerial Institute. After the institute meeting, he says, you cannot imagine how I was pummeled by some of the old timers because I pressed on the personality of the Holy Spirit as the third person of the Godhead. Letter from Leroy Fromm to Dr. Otto H. Christensen, October 27, 1960. Ellen White has also used the term third person of the Godhead, but with very different connotations. 1928, Leroy Fromm, founder of Ministry Magazine, begins promoting the American Revised Standard version of the Bible and denote, demotes the King James Bible to not accurate and old-fashioned status. He tours the U.S. promoting the Sunday Trinity to Adventist ministers and writes the book, The Coming of the Comforter. 1928. 
The Coming of the Comforter, a pro-Trinity book by Leroy Frome, is published from upon urgent request of hundreds of ministers who heard him speak. In the book, he emphasizes strongly the personality of the Holy Spirit as a separate being from the Father and the Son. The book contains many quotations from the spirit of prophecy, but the interpretation is totally different than the teaching of the pioneers. You can click here for more on From. 1928. W.W. Prescott, who was educated by the secular Dartmouth College, writes 11 articles in the Signs of the Times documenting the Sunday scholar's proof of the inferiority of the King James Bible. The Bible of the pioneers is under assault and being replaced by modern corrupt versions. 1928, General Conference leadership adopts the American Revised Version Bible, which is inspired by the Jesuits of Rome, above the authorized King James Version Bible of the pioneers. These versions comes from scholars that rely on two manuscripts, the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, Constantine's state Bibles. This is the second wrong step toward ecumenism. This step is now possible with the passing of the last pioneer. 1929, healing of the deadly wound of the papacy. The Lateran Treaty is signed between Italy and the Vatican, setting the Roman question, settling the Roman question. Italy now recognizes the Vatican city state as an independent state and agrees to give the church financial compensation for the loss of the papal states. 1929, A.T. Robinson writes an article, One God and One Mediator for the Review, and Harold quoting 1 Corinthians 15, 28, giving the impression that the one God is the Father only. 1930, General Conference votes, votes to publish a church manual in 1893. The General Conference votes to publish a church manual. In 1883, the General Conference session had voted no. They have also decided it was time for a new statement of fundamental beliefs. This is the third wrong step towards ecumenism. Attitudes have now changed and become more liberal. Theological wounds, wounds have healed. The last of the pioneers has died and their voices are no longer heard. Leadership wants to change the old SDA doctrines on the final atonement in heaven to the human nature of Christ, three, the place of scripture and prophecy in the, in the church, and four, the doctrine of the Trinity as taught by evangelicals. Ellen White warns, in no respect is God's work to be circumscribed by man-made restrictions. Many of the ambitious plans and policies that have been made are not endorsed by him. One manuscript releases 245. 1930. Our authorized Bible vindicated by B.G. Wilkinson is published, documenting the origins and history of the King James Bible. The General Conference tries to discontinue the book, and, Wil and Wilkinson writes a second book in defense of the position of his position, answers to objections to our authorized Bible vindicated. 1931. Church leaders in Africa request a statement that will assist, assist in a better understanding of our work. 27 Fundamentals in Introduction. In answer to, our, to that request, a suitable statement of faith is placed in the 1931 yearbook. 1931. Yearbook with new statements of beliefs is published without a vote or authority. The General Conference President, C.H. Watson, is voted the authority to select a committee of four men in which he is a member to prepare a statement of, for publication in the yearbook. The four are General Conference Associate Secretary M.E. Kern, Review Editor F.M. Wilcox, Manager of Review and Herald E.R. Palmer, and GC President C.H. Watson. Francis McClellan Wilcox, Editor of the Review and Herald for 33 years alone, writes up the new statement of beliefs with 22 fundamental beliefs with the approval of the committee and passed it over to Edson Rogers, General Conference Statistician from 1903 to 1941, who places it in the 1931 yearbook. Leroy Fromm would lay, later complain that there was a consensus because no one complained. He fails to mention the church was unaware of this action. President Watson knows 
but does not seek to take official action. Thus, the statement of beliefs is added not by approval of the GC, but by common consent and is accepted without challenge from Movement of Destiny, page 414. So this is now the um, this is now the fundamental beliefs. You can see now that it's changed. The offshoot has changed that the God of our Trinity consists of the eternal Father. So now that is changed. The first two fundamental principles of James White, Uriah Smith, 1872, 1874, 1889, 1914 yearbooks state in part that there is one God everywhere present by his representative, the Holy Spirit, that there is one Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of the Eternal Father, that he took on him the nature of the seed of Abraham for the redemption of our fallen race. The 1931 yearbook now states that the Godhead or Trinity consists of the Eternal Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Eternal Father, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead. Page 377. Points that are entirely removed from the 1872, 1874, 1889 fundamental principles, principles include prophecy as part of God's revelation to man. World history fulfills Bible prophecy. And papacy, man of sin, changed the Sabbath. The pioneer view on the post-fall human nature of Christ is changed to pre-fall human nature. Christ's work of final atonement in the most holy place since 1844 is omitted and now replaced with atonement being completed in the cross, and Christ now lives to make intercession for us. And the cleansing of the sanctuary involving the work of blotting out sins is now replaced with only a work of judgment. Now, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has a new statement on the Trinity, a new Christ with unfallen human nature instead of a fallen but not corrupted human nature, and a new final authority that was completed in the cross rather than finished in the most holy place in heaven. These doctrinal changes place the Seventh-day Adventist Church in harmony with the Sunday-keeping churches of Babylon and make it possible for ecumenical ties with other denominations. To substantiate these new apostate doctrines, a new Bible, the American Revised Version, now approved by the papacy, is embraced. 1931. F.M. Wilcox publishes Review and Herald article called Christ is Very God, where he states, we recognize the divine trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, each possessing a distinct and separate personality, but one in nature and in purpose, so welded together in this infinite union that the Apostle James speaks of them as one God, James 2.19. This divine unity is similar to the unity existing between Christ and the believer, and between the believer and Different believers in their fellowship in Christ Jesus. Review and Herald, October 29, 1931, page 3. Christ is very God. This is very important. This explains how in the 1930s, as they understood the divine trinity. By 1931, periodical tracts and books had been published on the three persons of the Godhead, the eternal preexistence and complete deity of Christ, and the personality of the Holy Spirit. By Leroy Fromm, Movement of Destiny, page 418. 1932, the first church manual is published with the 22 articles of fundamental beliefs, despite G.I. G. I., sorry, G. I. Butler's, not L. G. I. Butler's objection in, to having a church manual in 1883, Review and Herald, num, November 20. Now the church has an official creed for the first time in 1861. James White Warren, making a creed, is setting the stakes and bearing up the way to all future advancement. They say virtually that the Lord must not do anything further than what has been marked out in the creed. A creed and the spiritual gifts thus stand in direct opposition to each other. The Bible is our creed. We reject everything in the form of human creed. Review and Herald, October 8, 1869. Click here to view or download the 1932 church manual. So this is now the... Proof of the Church Manual, 18, 1932. 1935, death of Arthur Grosvenor Daniels, one of the key men in apostasy. 1935, letter from H.W. Carr to Willie White asking about the nature of the Holy Spirit as being promoted by some of the leaders being another separate person from the Father and the Son. Ellen White explaining that the Spirit of God and the Spirit and Christ, in you know, Christ, Holy Spirit is a divine personality, begins to be twisted into someone else other than Christ, the Comforter. Part of Willie White's response is this, the statement and the arguments of some of our ministers 
in their effort to prove that the Holy Spirit was an individual as our God, the Father in Christ, the eternal Son, have perplexed me and sometimes they had made me sad. One popular teacher say we may regard him, the Holy Spirit, as the fellow who's down here running things. Letter Willie White, April 30, 1935. So now this is the development of the Holy Spirit as, um, as being taught in the Sabbath school lesson. You can read it here. The Sabbath school lesson, fourth quarter, page 11 to 14, 1936. The General Conference Sabbath School Committee publishes a series of Sabbath school lesson studies starting with the fourth quarter, 1936, to the second quarter of 1938. The, the, the uh, original copies have been uh, shown to you. For the church... For the church, which is intended to show the world what Seventh-day Adventists officially believe and purportedly to show that the church still upholds the Adventist pioneer position and the nature of God in Christ. Six men, including F.M. Wilcox and M.E. Kern, were voted by the J.G.C. Committee in late 1935 to sit with the Sabbath School Department Lessons Committee. When they compiled the studies or essential Bible doctrines, the studies apply Trinitarian language to non-Trinitarian belief. In effect, subtly reinterpreting it in Trinitarian terms. In the third week of the fourth quarter 1936 lesson under the title The Godhead, the word Trinity is used twice, once as a heading and once as a subheading. Under the Trinity heading, they state three powers wrought in the work of creation and that the name of God is used of the Father and of the Son and the, of the Spirit, a kind of heavenly family name. This three... This three constitutes the Godhead. Then under the heading, unity of the Godhead, they state the Father is in the Son and the Son is in the Father. And the Spirit is the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ. Hence, all three dwell together and the three are one. Lesson 3, page 10. The only other time that the word Trinity is mentioned again is Lesson 10, in which since the divine Trinity is composed of the three persons, there is established personal, personal relationship between the Godhead and the one baptized. December 5, page 31. Nothing else is said about the word Trinity. The phrase Trinity doctrine is not used, but intimations of it are being subtly conveyed. At this point, the begotten belief is still the official belief. Time and death is needed, needed to change it to an unbegotten belief to, be, to support the false claim that Christ could not be begotten and yet be fully God in his pre-existence. Ellen White believed that Christ was truly begotten and still truly God, for she said in 1905, the Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, is truly God in infinity, but not in personality. Manuscript 116, December 19, 1905. The fourth quarter lesson rightly concludes regarding the preexistence of Christ, that he was therefore no part of creation, but was begotten of the Father in the days of eternity and was very God himself. Lesson 4, page 13. In the section regarding the deity of Christ, the lesson rightly recognizes that Christ, as the, as the begotten Son, has inherited God's name and therefore can rightly be called God. So it seems that as late as 1936, Ellen White's writings have actually not changed the beliefs of the church about the preexistence of Christ as the truly divine begotten Son of God, contrary to later claims that they had also. Also, at, the, at this point, the Holy Spirit is not officially regarded as a divine person, exactly like God in Christ, our persons. The lesson states, hence the Father sends the, the Spirit in the name of the Son, and that is as the Son's representative. The Spirit proceeded from the Father to do His work in the earth, hence the Father sends the Spirit, and the Son sends the Spirit. The Son speaks what the Father gives Him to speak. And the Spirit speaks what the Son gives him to speak. The Spirit is both the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ. Lesson 3, page 11. You can click here to view the original Sabbath School lesson of 1936. 1936. Benjamin Wilkinson answers a letter from Dr. T.S. Titter saying, replying to your letter of October 1913 regarding the doctrine of Trinity, I will say that Seventh-day Adventists do not and never ex had accepted the dark, mysterious Catholic doctrine of the Trinity. 1937, death of Willie C. White, son of James and Ellen White. 1939, W.W. W. Prescott preaches a sermon at the Tacoma Park Church where he says that scripture clearly implied the doctrine of the Trinity. 
There are three persons in the Godhead, but they are so mysteriously and indissolubly related to each other. The presence of one is equivalent to the presence of the other. Elder Judson S. Washburn protests what he hears and sees happening in the church by writing a letter to the GC president, J. L. McAlhany, against the Trinity Doctrine. It was circulated by the conference president to 32 ministers. 1941. General Conference Committee votes that the statement of belief is made available in leaflet form and officially released as our accepted statement of faith. The committee also approves a uniform baptismal covenant or vow in certificate form based on the now generally accepted fundamental beliefs declaration of 1931. General Conference session in San Francisco. The Trinitarian worded baptismal vow is formulated by 13 men led by Prescott. They call the Father the first person, Jesus the second person, the third, and the Holy is the third person. The word Trinity is not used. 1941-44. Hymnal Christ in song and hymns and tunes. Songbook copies are ordered back to the conferences for burning so that new church hymnal with Trinitarian influence can replace them. This is under the guise of Roy Allen Anderson. 1943, John Harvey Kellogg dies after seducing many to his heresy. 1944, removal, removal by committee of all 18 non-Trinitarian statements from Uriah Smith's book, Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation in an attempt to cover up history. They eliminated every portion that said Christ was begotten and the Father. W.W. W. Prescott and others changed the meaning of the daily sacrifice in the 2300 days message. Changes are also made to spiritual prophecy books, such as lower case change to capital letters for third person. 1944, Truth Triumphant by Benjamin G. Wilkinson is published, an exhaustive study of the history of God's church in the wilderness. It contains strong statements against the Trinity doctrine. Leroy Frome is angry and orders the destruction of the original offset press plates so that the book cannot be reprinted. 1944, death of William Warren Prescott, one of the key men in apostasy. 1945, Leroy Frome publishes a compilation of Ellen White quotes in Ministry Magazine to give credence to the eternity of Christ. Her understanding in this usage was far different from his. 1946, the leadership again calls for a committee of four to make a statement of official beliefs. However, it is again penned individually by F.M. Wilcox through a statement of beliefs on the Trinity originally written in 1931 by him and unofficially put in the yearbook. 1946, the compilation of evangelism with careful calculated use of certain Ellen White statements, mainly not even complete sentences to paint a picture that she was supposedly Trinitarian is done by Leroy Fromm. Roy Allen Anderson and Miss Lois Clisher, under the encouragement of Elder Brunson, 1966, uh, from letters with intent to deceive. From places these quotes from Ellen White in his book Evangelism, under the heading Misrepresentations of the Godhead, where she said, where she had said third person, three great powers, and heavenly trio, etc. When reading the statements under such a heading, a subtle message is given, but all these, in fact, refer to the Spirit of Christ and not another being. This is how Frome eventually managed to lead the entire Adventist church astray because people do not take the time to research what else Ellen White wrote on these topics. They just take the one-liners like they are hypnotized. Frome's book has persuaded many non-Trinitarians in the Colombian Union to lay down their arms and become Trinitarians. 1946, the General Conference session votes that all further revisions of the church manual must be approved in advance by the GC in World Session. 1946, the General Conference, after being conditioned for 27 years, and a new generation of members coming into the church during those 27 years, they knew nothing but the Trinity, votes to retain the 1931 baptismal vow officially. They then vote that changes to the baptismal vow, vow could only be made by the General Conference delegates in official session. Movement of Destiny, page 422. The Trinity is now protected by the necessity of an entire church vote in session. The entire ministry 
and the world membership now believes the Trinity is true. 1947, Charles is Longacker writes paper number 17, The Deity of Christ, clarifying the SDA Church original stand on the Godhead, a non-Trinitarian article, submitting it to the Bible Research Fellowship in discussion. This would be the last of any major resistance left in the church for decades to come. 1948, World Council of Churches is formally instituted in Amsterdam. 1949, Bible Readings for the Home Circle is revised by D.E. Rebach in an attempt to remove any non-Trinitarian Aryan or semi-Aryan statements. Roy Allen Anderson had his influence in this as well. 1950, death of Herbert Camden Lassie, one of the key men in apostasy. 1950, elders R.G. Willen and D.K. Short writes a thesis for the GC entitled 1888 Reexamine. This is eventually rejected with ongoing discussions up until 1961. This is a form of correction for the church through self-examination and getting back to truth. 1951. The church manual was published endorsing Trinitarian sentiments in both the fundamental beliefs and the baptismal vows. One thing to take note is that while the expression Trinity or the Godhead was defined as consisting in the Father, Jesus, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, the third person, Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, were not necessarily defined as one God of the Bible as they are now. Moreover, while the doctrinal instructions for baptismal candidates certainly appears to affirm the Trinitarian position of church during this time, the baptismal vows one and two remains not as explicitly Trinitarians, three gods equals one God of the Bible concept, until it was amended in 1990 church manual. See 1990, you can click here to view download 1951 church manual. So this is what it, what it looks like, that the, consists of... Um, the Godhead Trinity consists of the eternal Father, a personal spiritual being, omni, omni, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, infinite wisdom and love. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the eternal Father, through whom all things were created and through whom all the salvation, the redeemed host will be accomplished. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, the great regenerating power in the work of redemption, Matthew 8, 19. So you could, you could uh, read this for yourselves, the, the proof. 1952. What happened then? A book is copyrighted called Principles of Life and printed in 1956. It has been used by school children as their Bible doctrine study book. One paragraph says, While God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are three separate and distinct beings, yet they are one in nature, in character, in purpose, working in such close relationship to be one. Principles of Life, page 28. 1955. Death of Elder John Hudson S. Washburn, one of the last of the connecting links to truth. 1955-56, evangelical conferences takes place between the General Conference, represented by Frome, Anderson, Reed, and Onra, and Walter Martin and Don Donald Barnhouse, editor of Eternity Magazine. Are Adventists a cult? That was the question of the evangelicals. The Trinity Doctrine is one of the first issues discussed. Concessions are made in the, on the atonement and the humanity of Christ. Christ's nature was changed to that of Adam's nature before the fall. The teaching of the, aton of the atonement was changed to completed at the cross instead of commencing at the cross. These changes were required by the Protestant denominations for the SDA to be classified as an evangelical Christian church instead of a cult or sect. We are we submit to the daughters of the harlot in fear of being labeled a cult and reject the spirit of prophecy writings because they do not reflect Adventist theology. But we were previously labeled a cult for, for years because our beliefs stood out from the rest of Protestantism. Ellen White warned in 1894 not to bridge the gulf that separates the children of God from the children of darkness. But this is not heeded. Donald Barnhouse writes in his Eternity magazine, immediately it was perceived that the Adventists were strenuously denying certain doctrinal positions which had been previously attributed to them. The Adventists specifically repudiate any teachings by ministers or members of their faith who have believed, proclaimed, and written any matter which would classify them among Arians. Eternities, September 1956. 1957. 
Questions and Doctrine is published following these meetings, a pro-Trinity book written by Leroy Edwin Fromm, W.E. Red, Reed, R.A. Anderson, and T.E. Unruh. This is to match the Seventh-day Adventist Church with the Protestant and evangelical world to be accepted so we would not be labeled as cult. 1957. The church declares oneness with the fallen Protestant denominations. We are one with our fellow Christian denominational groups in the great fundamentals of the faith of the faith once delivered to the saints. Question and doctrine, page 32. 8, 1957. Seventh day Adventist Church joins the CWC, Christian World Communions. 1958. Death of Charles S. Lungerker, a champion of religious liberty and author who stood for the original pioneer views within Adventism. 1962, the Second Vatican Council begins to be held, concluding in 1965. The Roman Church repositioned itself in relation to the modern world. Major changes occur in the Catholic Church, but the intention remains the same. The final set, stage is set for the Jesuits' order's counter-reformation to take over all the Protestant churches. 1962. The World Council of Churches incorporates the Trinity Doctrine in its prerequisite for membership and becomes the foremost ecumenical organization. 1962, the 1962 yearbook reprints the statement of faith in substantially the same form in which it appeared in 1931. 1965, Bernard Sitton urges the General Conference to revise our fundamental beliefs. Several of our leaders had just traveled to Geneva, Switzerland to enter into negotiations for closer contacts with the World Council of Churches headquarters. 1965, Birth Beverly Beach becomes the SDA ecumenical liais liaison with other denominations. In 1968, death of Elder Benjamin G. Wilkinson, PhD, after 76 years of active church service. This pioneer of Adventism spoke against the new Trinity doctrine until his death. 1968, Uppsala, Sweden, World Council of Churches admits to full membership. The representatives from non-member churches, which include the Seventh-day Adventist Church, published on July 12, New York Times newspaper. 1870, Berth B. Beach is elected as the Secretary General of the Annual Conference of Secretaries of the Christian World Communions, which represents about 2 billion Christians and covers more churches than any other organization. He will hold this. He will hold this position until two thousand three. Nineteen seventy one, Movement of Destiny by Leroy Fromm gets published. Prum admits to alteration made from nineteen thirty one to standard works to correct erone erroneous views on the Godhead to make them trinitarian. His historical account says we begin as semi Aryans, but steadily rose to become a strong movement, able to take our place among mainland Protestant denominations. Together with men, with them, we wholeheartedly profess Christendom's doctrine of the Trinity in the full deity of Christ. He also makes other admissions of wrongdoing, which include going to Sunday keeping authors for his material that is included in his book, The Coming of the Comforter, that was published in 1928, Movement of Destiny, page 322, 400, and 422. The principles and provisions of Adventism are altered in the book's Seventh-day Adventist Answer, Question and Doctrine and Movement of Destiny. The divine personalities, the Adventist, the pioneer Adventist position of the human nature of Christ is also changed and omitted in SDA publication. Publications. 1973, Berth B. Beach, Secretary of the Northern Europe West Africa Division and, com and when company begins social engineering, of acceptance of being one with the world in joining the World Council of Churches. He co-authors a book with Locus Vischer, Secretary of the WCC, titled So Much in Common Between the World Council of Churches and the Seventh-day Adventist Church, published by the World Council of Churches, Geneva, Switzerland, 1973, saying, the member churches of the World Council of Churches and Seventh-day Adventists are in agreement on the fundamental articles of the Christian faith to set forth on the on the in the three ancient symbols, creeds, Apostolicum, Nicaino, Constantinopolitan, Athanasium. This agreement finds expression in unqualified acceptance of the doctrines of the Trinity and the two natures. So much in common, page 40. 
Ellen White had warned that it is a grave mistake on the part of those who are children of God to seek the bridge of the gulf that separate them from the children of darkness by yielding principle, by compromising truth. Bible Echo, April 9, 1894, paragraph 6. 1974, death of Leroy Fromm, one of the key men in apostasy. 1974, the 1919 Bible Conference transcript is dis discovered by Don Yost and Don Mansell. Mansell at the General Conference Archives. 1975, a non-Trinitarian paper by, by Edward Edstrom is printed at the request of the Board of Walla Walla Valley Academy in a book form called Human Spirit, Divine Spirit. Edstrom's belief in the Trinity has been, had been challenged in 1954 when fellow pastors and workers in Central Africa were confronted by Muslims who claim one God, Allah, while Christianity appeared to have three separate distinct gods that were called one, human spirit, divine spirit, intron, number four. 1976, Neil Wilson, president of the North American Division of SDA, gives this sworn statement in the silver tubular legal case involving the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Although it is true that there was a period in the life of the Seventh-day Adventist Church when the denomination took a different anti-Roman Catholic viewpoint, and the term hierarchy was used in pejorative sense to refer to the papal form or of church governance. That attitude in the church part was nothing more than a manifestation of widespread anti popery among conservative Protestant denominations in the early part of the century, of this century, and the latter part of the last, and which has now been consigned to the historical trash heap so far as the Seventh day of his church is concerned. Mira K. McLeod, lawsuit, page four, footnote number two, docket entry number 84, EEQC versus PPAC 74, 2025, CBR sworn statement dated February 6, 1976. Ellen White warned in 1894, it is a backsliding church that lessens the distance between itself and the papacy. Signs of the Times, February 19, 1894. 1977, Pope Paul VI re rewards Birthby Beach for his book with a private audience in the Vatican. Beach presents the Pope with a book and a gold medallion confirming friendship of the Seventh-day Adventist Church with the Vatican. The medallion is engraved witness to the validity of the Ten Commandments, while the other commandments are represented simply as Roman numerals. The words of the fourth, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, are written out. WD. Eva, Adventist Review, book medallion presented by to Pope, August 11, 1977, 849, page 23. However, the seventh day was removed from the text and quoted in the same, in the same way as it was quoted in any Roman Catholic catechism, catechism. Beach represents the worldwide Seventh day Adventist Church in an interview over Vatican Radio, referring to the Pope as Holy Father. When Ellen White has clearly warned, the Pope is not regarded by God as anything more than a man who is acting out in our world the character of the man of sin, representing in his claims the power and authority which Satan claimed in the heavenly courts. Five, fifth manuscript releases, 102. 1979. W. Duncan Eva and Bernard Sitton are working behind the scenes in moving agenda to adopt a new statement of fundamental beliefs. The revision draft is sent to the theologians at Andrews University to ready it for prime time at the World Session in April 1980. Back in 1946, the committee had put forth an action, making it almost impossible to change any belief, but that hurdle was overcome and now moving forward. forward. 1980. World General Conference in session, Dallas, Texas, officially votes to accept the Trinity Doctrine as part of the 27 Fundamental Beliefs of Seventh-day Adventists. April 23, 1980 issue, the Adventist Review was published detailing the discussion surrounding the formulation of the new beliefs. So this is the man who voted the Trinity into the church. By officially approving the Trinity, as a fundamental belief of Seventh-day Adventists, the denomination has publicly declared to the world that she is following in the steps of the daughters of fallen churches, of the mother of harlots, the Roman Catholic Church, whose central pillar doctrine is the Trinity. 1980, 
Ex-Jesuit priest Alberto Rivera states that all the mainstream churches were taken over or under control of Rome by 1980. Secret Terrorist, page 108. 1981, Neil C. Wilson, now General Conference President, announces that the church has officially adopted the Trinity Doctrine, which is now number two in the church 27 fundamental beliefs. He declares before the Seventh-day Adventist Church that there is another universal and truly Catholic organization, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Adventist Review, March 5th, 1981, page 3. In 1981, Adventist Review 730, 1981, special issue in Bible doctrines. The Trinity doctrine is explained one year after it was voted as an official doctrine, which was in 1980. It states, while no single scriptural passage states formally the doctrine of the Trinity, it is assumed as a fact by Bible writers and mentioned several times. Only by faith can we accept the existence of the Trinity. Page 4. The concept of the Trinity, namely the idea that the three are one, is not explicitly stated but not assumed. Fernando L. Canale, Handbook of Seventh-day Adventist Theology, Seventh-day Adventist Encyclopedia, Volume 12, page 138, Doctrine of God. My professor in IAS was a student of Fernando L. Canale for my Master of Arts, um, for my Master's of Arts degree, and uh, I was taught about the Trinity. So that confirms 1981. So now let's go to 1984. Baptismal vow is reformatted again, pro-Trinity. 1985, a new Seventh-day Adventist hymnal takes the place of the older church hymnal of 1941. It is decided that there are even more songs that can be replaced or changed to fit the new 1980s fundamental beliefs. Catholic terms are used in headings and responsive readings. 1986, the official doctrine of the church is stated in the church manual. There is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a unity of three co-eternal persons. SDA Church Manual, Chapter 2, page 23, refer also to the book, The Seventh-day Adventist Belief, 27 Fundamentals, the Trinity. 1988, Seventh-day Adventist Belief, 27 Fundamental Belief book is published strongly Trinitarian. 1980, 90. Baptismal vow revised to make it decisively Trinitarian. 55th General Conference session on July 11, 1990 at 2 p.m. voted to revise the church manual, page 44. Baptismal vow and baptism to read as follows. See pic pictures below. 1986 church manual, first baptismal vow states, Do you believe in God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, and in the Holy Spirit? In 1990, revised first baptism vow states, do you believe there is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a unity of three co-eternal persons? You can click here to view the 1986. So this was the changes as presented as evidence. 1993, George Knight, a professor and prominent SDA theologian, makes this startling confession in Ministry Magazine, October 1993. Most of the founders of Seventh-day Adventism would not be able to join the church today if they had to subscribe to the denomination's fundamental beliefs. More especially, most would not be able to agree to belief number two, which deals with the doctrine of the Trinity. In all actuality, this would have included all of the founders and pioneers of the early Seventh-day Adventist church, and it should be alarming to today's members. 1994, William Johnson, editor of the Adventist Review, writes, Adventist beliefs had changed over the years under the impact of present truth. Most startling is the teaching regarding Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Adventist Review, January 6, 1994. While the pre-existence of Christ is held, the divine begotten sonship of Christ as held by the official world church up to 1940s is denied as a false doctrine, as Johnson puts it. 1995, General Conference World Session in Utrecht, Netherlands. The Vatican flag is carried through the meeting hall in a singular fashion amidst an unusually loud ovation. 1996, devotional, you shall receive power is printed in which the prophet's words are changed. Back in 1889, Ellen Wright wrote, why should we not prostrate ourselves at the throne of divine grace, praying that God's spirit may be poured out upon it Upon us, it was upon the disciples. Its presence will often 
soften our hard hearts and fill us with joy and rejoicing, transforming us into channels of blessing. The Lord would have every one of his children rich in faith, and this faith is the fruit of the working of the Holy Spirit upon the mind. It dwells with each soul who will receive it, speaking to the impenitent in words of warning and pointing them to Jesus, the Lamb of God that take it away, the sin of the world. It causes light to shine in the minds of those who are seeking to cooperate with God, giving them efficiency and wisdom to do his work. Signs of the Times, September 27, 1899. If you look carefully, you will see that Ellen White has used the word it four times and one it's when speaking of the Holy Spirit. But in the devotional, you, you shall receive power, page 59, it has been changed to he or his or him. See also, you shall receive power, page 93, 151, 164, 183, 383, 318, 319, 321, 323, 325, 344 for the other changes. Alan White estate has since retracted the changes back to it. Learn from here. 1996, Merlin Burt writes, During the 1930s, there continued to be statements teaching the old view. This largely char changed during the 1940s. The fourth quarter of 1936 Sabbath school lesson quarterly was prepared by T.M. French. French concluded regarding Christ's preexistence with these words, He was therefore no part of creation, but was begotten of the Father. In the days of eternity, he was very God himself. It seems that French was mixing Wilcox's fundamental beliefs, reference to Christ as very God with the old view of a begotten Christ, Merlin D. Burt, demise of a semi-Arianism, an anti-Trinitarianism <coughs> anti in Adventist theology, 1888-1957, page 40. So the belief in begotten Christ has become the old view, while the unbegotten Christ is now the new official accepted doctrine. 1997, Seventh-day Adventist logo is changed from the three angels to flames and cross, diminishing our distinctive identity as teaching the three angels' messages. 1999, B.T. Rice, pastor of the St. Louis S.D.A. Northside Church, addresses the Pope in a Vatican Mass held locally as, Pope, Your Holiness, Your Historic Visit to St. Louis. 2003, John R. Grass General Conference Director of Public Affairs and Religious Liberty since 1995 is elected sec as Secretary General of the Annual Conference of Secretaries of the Christian World Communions. Succeeding Birth B. Beach, Beach, Grass would hold this position until 2014. 2003, Questions and Doctrines is republished and circulated by Andrews University, pro-Trinitarian, pro-unfallen human nature of Christ. 2005, baptismal vow is revised to the Trinity Creed to, to read. Do you accept the teachings of the Bible as expressed in the statement of fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? And do you pledge to live your life by God's grace in harmony with these teachings? For the first time in Adventist history, the church has based its membership on a creed. The prophet had told us 95 years earlier, the Bible and the Bible alone is to be our creed. Review and Herald, December 15, 18. 95. 2008. In contrast to the 1936 Sabbath school lesson, the second quarter lesson in 2008 teaches that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not really a Father or a Son or Holy Spirit, but are three divine beings who are just role playing these parts. Here is a quote from the lesson. But imagine a situation in which the being we'd come to know as God the Father came to die for us. And the one who had come to know as Jesus stayed back in heaven. We are speaking in human terms to make a point. Nothing would have changed except that we would have been calling each by the name we now use for the other. That is what equality in the deity means. April 10, 2008, page 19. As Jay and Andrew said, this Trinity doctrine destroys the personality of God and his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Review and Herald, March 6, 1855. 2012, the White House, the White Estate, I'm sorry, database is hacked by anonymous party known as SDA Anonymous. Their concern is for public access to all of Ellen White's documents, and they have been restricted, and it is a public domain at this point as they should belong to the people. 
the meaning in context of her writings is hampered by not being able to view everything in its entirety. The hacker is pushing for full digitized access to anyone wanting them, not just a handful of privileged people. The white estate attempts to sue for damages. The hacker threatens to release all of Sister White's writings. Their request is that the white estate does it, does it to save their reputation. Their request is that the white, hey, white estate does it to save their reputation. 2015, revision was made on the fundamental belief number 18 pertaining to the gift of prophecy. Ellen White's authority is diminished. The phrases as the Lord's messenger and a continuing authoritative source of truth are removed. Arthur Steele would later say the suggested changes seek to avoid giving the impression that Ellen G. White and the Bible are equivalent sources of truth. I have, no, I have had no claims to make, only that I am instructed that I am the Lord's messenger and he called me. I am the Lord's messenger that he called me in my youth to be his messenger to receive his word and to give a clear and decided message in the name of the Lord Jesus. Early in my youth, I was asked several times, are you a prophet? I have, I have ever responded. I am the Lord's messenger. I know that many have called me a prophet, but I have made no claim to this title. My savior declared me to be his messenger. Selected messages, book one, 1958, page 332, page 32. 2014, Ganon Dupe, General Conference Director of Public Affairs and Religious Liberty since 2011, is elected as the new Secretary General of the Annual Conference of Secretaries of the Christian World Communions. 2015, Ellen White's Symposium is held at Andrews University and spread worldwide, denies the spirit of prophecy's inspired authority to define doctrinal faith and practice, but only as theological and practical guidance an end time application. 2015, the white estate reaches a court settlement with the SDA Anonymous and releases the rest of Ellen White's unpublished writings that they have been holding back for years. The SDA Anonymous hacked into SG, Ellen G. White's estate's database was able to obtain files containing manuscripts that were not released to the public. The, con the collection contains approximately 8,300 type documents, letters, and manuscripts dating from 1845 to 1915. Honest Adventists now fully know that Sister White wrote over and over that Jesus is their comforter coming to them in spirit form as the Holy Spirit, not some other mystery person or ghost. The dogma of the denomination teaching has been shown to be an error for those who want to know and are paying attention. Click here for all the documents you can um, you can examine for yourselves. Brethren, beloved of God, believers in the one true God and his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is our comforter, according to the prophet of God, Alan G. White, and the pioneers of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I believe that my journey when I was... When I was asked to leave the Illinois Conference as a senior pastor of one of the largest churches there in terms of tithe and membership, when I preached my last sermon about John 17, 3, I have no idea about the One True God movement. I have no clue about what's going on with the Ellen White estate and the SDA anonymous hacking. I have no clue. I am oblivious to all of this, but I preach. John 73, and that was my last sermon in Illinois Conference, as recorded on my website and on my channel and in the archives of my church, Hinsdale Filipino American Seventh-day Adventist Church, as a former senior pastor. Now I, I could see pieces together. God had called me to believe on him because of what had happened to me, I was able to examine re-examine the false teaching that I received from my professor who was taught under Canale, uh, stalwart of Trinity teaching in Andrews University. So now I can say to the world, the true option 
is the Trinitarian Seventh-day Adventist Church of today. The original platform is Seventh-day Adventists believe in one true God and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit is Christ's presence and power, his divine omnipower and omnipresence given by the one true God, his Father. So I, I pray and I hope that you will learn. It has been exhaustive reading. And I thank you for bearing with me. And I praise God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, for this great light. May we love the truth. And now we can completely say the one true God movement and His only begotten Son is the true doctrine of the early Seventh-day Adventist Church. The false doctrine is the Trinity doctrine of the offshoot Seventh-day Adventist led by Ted Wilson today. They had been so close to Rome than ever before, which Alan G. White and the pioneers, including John Nevin Andrews and the rest of the stalwarts of the Seventh-day Adventist intellectual, um, intellectual capacity abhors being close to Rome. And I say to you, my friends, come out of her, my people. Let us reclaim the true Seventh-day Adventism in our hearts and in our minds. Because legally, they have hijacked the corporate Seventh-day Adventist church name, logo, and finances. Come out of her, my people, today before the seven last plagues comes to those who are drinking from the wine of Babylon. May the only true God and his son bless you and keep you. This is my